Hey, welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Oh, that's going to even work. Coming up on the Best of Any Live. It's Sun Earth Day 2011. We'll be talking to solar scientists and educators. And our additional special guest in studio, live, the tweeters from the Sun Earth Day Tweet Up, or as I like to call them, the Twitterazzi. Did you trademark that? Uh, it's pending after magnetosphere. So, Troy, what is the theme for Sun Earth Day for 2011? Sun Earth Day this year is Ancient Mysteries, Future Discoveries. And as many of you know, we were talking earlier to our Twitter crowd and our audience about Sun Earth Day. It's been around for 10 years, and each year Sun Earth Day has a new theme. And we started in year one with having a solar blast, and we moved from that into several more themes that you can go onto the Sun Earth Day website actually now, and you'll be able to see all of the past Sun Earth Day themes. I've been there. I go there often. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a theme on you one year, Blair. We'll have, you know, the it's a solar hair. Solar Blair. Blair uh, solar Blair. Uh, there you go. There you go. Like now, Michelle, we, we're looking at Sun Earth Day, which is a, a particular day today. We know that Sun Earth Day is every day. Oh, uh, Thank but when you look at the, the heliophysics program as a whole, I mean, just how important is it to know about the sun? Well, then you're going to be hearing from a lot of people today that are going to talk to you about space weather and how that impacts the Earth and our satellites and all of that. But to me, that's kind of, to some degree, I like to step back and say the sun is absolutely everything to us. I mean, when, when I was a kid, one of my favorite facts from grade school was that the, the very energy that my brain is using for my neurons to fire or my muscles to move, that came from the sun. All of the energy on the Earth came from the sun originally from a nuclear reaction deep inside the core. Right. So literally, the sun is everything to us. NASA has tons of satellites, but we have about 18 of them right now that are they're simply tasked to looking at the sun or how the sun interacts with the Earth. So, I mean, there's an armada of solar spacecraft up there run by NASA. So everything the sun does, every little hiccup right now, we've got a beautiful ringside seat. Which is very helpful because we're in solar maximum. So oh, uh, yes. you get a good view at the, the most interesting time. We're looking for the next next few years being incredible, right? The sun does this every 11 years. We're, we're, we're just edging up now on the peak of the cycle. We're in for a show. Well, speaking of good shows, uh, we have a lot planned for today. <laughs> Ron, are we good? Good. We're here with Dave Dooling at the Visitor Center at the National Solar Observatory in Sunspot, New Mexico. And uh, Dave, uh, you've created quite an exhibit here uh, giving us context Thank for you. the sun. What, what, what's going on with this massive representation of well, the sun? Well, this is the sun at a scale of about 1 to 250 million. Blow it up 250 million times, that's the diameter of the sun. It's 18 feet wide, and here's Earth by comparison. Yes. That's pretty small. The whole purpose is to put the solar system, the planets in context with the sun and give people a better understanding the one star that we have an intimate relationship with and really influences what goes on down here at Earth. So Pete, we're out here in the middle of this remote location and I'm wondering how in the world did you figure out that this might actually be the site of an ancient solar observatory? Well, probably a combination of luck and circumstance. We were asked to do an archaeological survey to see if there was anything that might be historic. And almost the last day of this survey, we were riding out on this long exposed ridge that we're standing on the side of right now. We came around a extremely weather-beaten tree, and here was this small circular round room, and there were lichen growing on the rocks that it was constructed out of, and in some cases, the lichen had spanned gaps between adjacent rocks of as much as a half an inch. Well, lichen are a very slow-growing plant, so we knew that this structure hadn't been built by our local Boy Scouts. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the images you have here. What, what is this particular image behind okay, you here? This one is an image of sunspots and again, Earth in scale to sunspots. And what you have to keep in mind is these dark regions that we call spots are actually quite bright. They're brighter than the tip of an arc welder's torch and that tells you how much brighter everything is around here. What's going on is magnetic flux tubes erupt from the interior of the sun, arc into space, and then back down into the interior. The strength 
of that magnetism is about two to three thousand times the strength of magnetism here at the surface of Earth in a much larger volume, many, many times the volume of Earth as it sweeps into space. So that's a tremendous amount of energy, just a small part of the sun's total energy, but this is what drives space weather. Inside is on the order of about seven to eight thousand Fahrenheit, so you only need SPF 500,000. That's, uh, that's right, which you can get at any convenience store. I've got a couple of gallons at home if you want. And, and to our viewers, please reapply after swimming. Yes. And the, the geometry suggested that from the location, this rock room we had found, that the winter solstice sunset would set right behind Sierra Blanca Peak, which is across the valley from this ridge. We did the observations and the winter solstice sunset was spectacular behind Sierra Blanca. Surprisingly, the winter solstice sunrise also came up behind a prominent feature, a peak called Pajarito Peak, 23 miles away. If we were correct, and this was an astronomical site, there ought to be another site right there at Pajarito Peak. Three years later, we were guided by an old prospector who was familiar with the region. The name's Yukon Cornelius, the greatest prospector in the north! He took us right out to Pajarito Peak, and lo and behold, there was the same sort of stuff, as well as prehistoric artifacts, ceramics and chipped stone, confirming our conjecture that it was prehistoric, and given the geometric relationship, the only explanation was that it had an astronomical purpose. It's crucial for a species, especially one that's expanding from one environment into another, you really need to know something about the calendar and astronomy. And the baseline of all uh, astronomy still is the sun. On deck, we have Eric Christian, Tom Moore, and Lou Mayo. Of course, first we need to talk to Troy Klein, who has apparently visited several ancient solar observatories. Land of the Lost? Oh, come on, Chris. Everyone knows LOL is Jurassic. And one of the things that I, I have to tell you is when you're watching a solar alignment take place in front of you, whether it be something called sun daggers, where two shafts of light because of the angle of the sun hitting certain rocks, ancient people like the ancient Pueblo people and ancient Anasazi Indians of the Southwest would look at how the, the light played across these rocks and in shadows, and they would create daggers of light in certain places that they marked with petroglyphs. I thought, well, that's, that's going to be pretty cool to see. I'll, we'll take pictures and well, all the educators and workshops We'll make some materials for that. But what blew me away, what really grabbed me, was the feeling that was overwhelming when you watch something like that happen. For instance, how many of you have watched a total solar eclipse and when that happened? Were you expecting at that moment the feeling? I mean, you don't. It, people start reacting and suddenly it's like you are part of the grander scheme of things in the universe. You suddenly see and feel and experience that connection. Those are our forefathers of, of, of humankind. And they've been studying the sun for centuries and many cultures have been studying the sun throughout the world for centuries. And what we love to do is draw attention to the respect of those cultures and what those people did Absolutely. that have actually helped us get to the point where we are today. Now, people have been studying the sun for centuries for a variety of different reasons. Before it was a means of survival survival for, for planning and right. growing and ceremony, but today we still study the sun for as survival. a means of survival <laughs> as we go into space yeah. and we send satellites and we have our And that's a great segue because we talked about the ancient mysteries, the ancient observatories, sure. and now in the second half let's look at the future discoveries. So Eric, what is IBEX all about? IBEX stands for the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. It's part of the Explorer program at NASA, and it's an extremely successful little spacecraft that's looking at the very edge of our solar system. From what I understand, it's about the size of a stop sign? It's about the size of a truck tire, a truck tire in, in okay. height and stuff. So it's, you know, you could fit it on the desk here. Okay. It's really very small as satellites go, and it's in Earth orbit, but in a very elliptical Earth orbit that goes almost all the way out to the moon. And from Earth orbit, it takes images of the distant parts of our solar system, way out beyond Pluto, in what's called the solar wind termination shock and the heliopause. Now, what do you mean by termination shock and heliopause? A solar wind termination shock is a region where the solar wind, which is moving really fast, million miles per hour in close to the Earth, at some point it has to slow down very quickly, and that's what's called the solar wind termination shock. Now this solar wind, from understanding the solar wind as it's shooting out towards this, 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 the boundary layer, actually helps us from all the galactic cosmic rays from coming in? Well, the, the solar wind has actually blown a bubble 
in interstellar space. It's not only the solar wind, it's actually the magnetic field that comes along with the solar wind that's really doing it. And the solar wind and the magnetic field act as a force field. And there are galactic cosmic rays, radiations coming from supernovas distant in the galaxy. The solar wind termination shock, the region out there, acts as a force field and reduces the number that hit the Earth by quite a bit. Then the Earth's magnetic field actually reduces it even more and the atmosphere really knocks it down so that we're safe here on Earth without all the radiation. It's understanding how that has changes with time is one of the things that IBEX is really looking at because over the history of the Earth, that bubble has gotten really small, so maybe even gotten small enough so that it was inside the orbit of the Earth and so we weren't protected by it. It can get bigger and so understanding how the solar system interacts with the rest of the galaxy is important. Now my question is this IBEX satellite is the size of a truck tire. Yeah. How do you collect data that's millions and millions of miles away orbiting around the Earth? Well, IBEX is, is a real fun experiment because it takes images, but not with light the way you think of a normal camera. It takes images with a special type of particle called an energetic neutral atom. It's an atom that starts out its life as a charged particle. That's how it gets accelerated up to some fraction of the speed of light. And then it collects an electron and becomes neutral again. And once it becomes neutral, it travels straight, just the way a photon, just the way light does. And because it travels straight, you can use it to image. And that's what IBEX does. It has two one-pixel cameras that by spinning, it takes a steady image over six months of the edge of the solar system where these energetic neutral atoms are created. So what would an image look like well, if I were to... here's one of the maps. And so this is a flat projection looking from the inside out at the sphere of the edge of our solar system. Okay. And what you see here is actually this feature which we call a ribbon of really bright energetic neutral atoms is something that surprised us all. No one expected it, it wasn't predicted by any models, and we still don't know. There's something out at the edge of the solar system that's generating a lot of particles that we see with IBEX that we don't know what's doing it. I don't know if anybody else is concerned about that band of particles on the outer end of our solar system that he just talked about, because I just left the movie Battle Los Angeles the other day, and I'm, I'm somewhat concerned. I'm somewhat concerned. Guys? It's just plain mysterious. There was no explanation for it in advance, and there are several models of what it might be now. One of them says that maybe that's the interstellar material out beyond the boundary of the solar system reconnecting with uh, the magnetic field of the solar system and the sun. And we don't know that that's, right, that's the right answer. But we do know that there's reconnection, quote unquote, occurring at the Earth at its magnetopause when the solar wind rams into it. And that's what the MMS mission is all about. It's four spacecraft flying oh, there in formation, go. taking a dip through perigee past the Earth and then heading out again toward the magnetopause, which is the boundary between the Earth's magnetic field and the solar magnetic field and the solar atmosphere. And when you see it go through that boundary here, it'll happen in an eye blink. It's hard to record with instruments, so we're going to have basically very high-speed instruments running. Is that the primary place where you'll be gathering data, is well, right at that point? There's actually two, one on the day side where the solar wind rams in, and then what happens is the solar wind connects to the Earth, and then it disconnects from the Earth on the night, on the night side in the tail. So we have another uh, observing point back there. Uh, we're talking about future discoveries, right? Uh, but we have two very old spacecraft sort of at the edge of our solar system, don't we, Blue? That's right, Blue. that's right. The Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft are the furthest out we've ever sent anything. And they are, are just approaching what we might call the edge of the solar system. Uh, you might define the edge of the solar system in a variety of ways. How far <laughs> out does gravity go or, or the sun's light? But it turns out that there's a real boundary called the heliopause. And beyond the heliopause, you're outside of interplanetary space. You're outside of the effects of the sun's magnetic field and charged particles into true interstellar space where now uh, the voyagers, when they get there, will be sensing interstellar winds for things like supernovas and so on. It's just amazing. Is, is there an inner office pool on what we'll find when we get outside of the solar system? Uh, not yet, but I'll take your money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have yes. much. Yeah. When we were talking to Eric Christian about IBEX, and he showed us that, that ribbon, that picture of that ribbon, he showed us that Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were sort of on the outside of that ribbon. I mean, is there That's any right. way that the Voyagers can detect that, that ribbon that's out there? Well, the Voyagers and IBEX are working together in some really exciting ways. IBEX is detecting the edges of the heliosphere from a remote sensing, but the Voyagers are actually out there in what we call in situ measurements. They have cosmic ray detectors, uh, radio plasma detectors, magnetic field detectors, so they're actually sensing it as it's happening. 
someone wants to know, how long do you expect the Voyager spacecraft to last? Oh, that's a great. Uh, that's a great question. Listen, Voyager is the best bang for your buck you ever got. Okay, with NASA, they launched in 1977 and originally just designed to go to Jupiter and Saturn. And then uh, we sent Voyager 2 onto Uranus and Neptune, and then uh, decided, hey, we can use some of these instruments to go on into what's called the Voyager Interstellar Mission. So we're kind of cycling instruments on and off now to conserve power. Uh, but it looks like we'll be able to communicate with both Voyagers 1 and 2 till about the year 2020, maybe 2025. Now, how long does Voyager 1 go until it becomes Voyager? <laughs> uh, nice. that, that's, that's in about three sequels. Oh, three sequels, okay. okay. It may take more than three sequels to find V'ger, but let's talk to Holly Gilbert, our favorite solar physicist. Of course, Holly's more of an expert on SDO and stereo. And by the way, what's a V'ger? Voyager from Star Trek? Oh, well, everyone knows Star Trek the motion picture isn't logical. We're very excited because SDO was launched um, in February of 2010, and it is providing unprecedented images of the sun at very high temporal resolution and spatial resolution, which allows us to see the very birthplace of where space weather is born. Sunspot regions are regions of very intense magnetic field, and they produce what we call flares, CMEs. The magnetic fields get tangled up, and they release a massive amount of energy. And when that um, energy, or the CMEs and the flares are directed towards the Earth, it can impact us here, and it can interfere with our magnetosphere. Causing magnetosphere. See, exactly. see how that would just work into your spiel ever so nicely? It's perfect. So we're taking multi-wavelength imaging so we can see the, the sun in different temperatures at the same time, which is important because there's many, many layers in the, in the atmosphere. We can see detailed information of the activity that is going on which again is extremely important at the high temporal resolution so that we're not missing anything. Continuous observations in all these wavelengths, extremely important for space weather. Stereo, what's, yes. the, what's the update on stereo? So stereo is very exciting now because for the first time we are able to see the entire surface of the sun, meaning all 360 degrees around because we had launched stereo spacecraft which are twin satellites that are moving away from each other slowly. About a month ago, they finally reached a point where we can actually see the entire higher surface of the sun. And that's important because in, in order to see the active regions and those sunspot regions that are on the backside, when they might be coming and rotating around and impacting the Earth. Oh. And for eight years, we're gonna get continuous um, observations of the entire surface of the sun. So that's extremely important and exciting for those of us that study space weather. We asked Holly to continue to show off her solar physicist skills in our Sun Earth Day solar game. She's seven for seven with three questions to go. Will she get all 10 correct? She has to. She's very competitive. Here we go. So we're okay. looking at that part of the sun. What would you call that particular zone? Okay, do you want me to answer before oh, yeah. oh, anybody oh, else? Oh, yeah. is, is everybody uh, cool? You got yeah, your answers? Y'all got their answers, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so that but would be the them. convective layer. Very good. Excellent. Uh, okay, yes. Excellent. That's you correct. You got that right. right. For school. <laughs> uh, okay. You got one in the back. Right? Career intact okay. for Holly. I think we have a couple more. Okay, yes. The corona. Yeah. Because that's the outer atmosphere. Okay, of the you didn't give the audience a chance, chance to think oh. about that. That's <laughs> Sorry. okay. All right. But we'll you see. knew it was Corona, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. That's All right. Second. Okay, this is this is going to be the last one. This is the toughest one out of them all. So I yes. really oh, want man. you to focus in on, on, on the air on this because I don't think she's going to get this. We'll yeah, see. this is key. Okay, there you go. See that? The, the radiator zone? Or is uh, there a little well, spot right there? Yeah, okay. there's, a little, there's a little. All right, we're going to need. You want to magnify? Magnify that just a little bit. See, there you go. Oh. Do you see the little white There's dot some there? person in the middle of the sun. Is that you, Blair? No, it's no, not. No, not. No, no, no. no, they actually that's, found, I think it was SDO, Stereo, found a little white it's, spot. It's uh, not me, it's, uh, there you go. Solar. Yes. <laughs> it is Blair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's rough about this is when I was in elementary school and we would watch this show, I was called Heat Miser for weeks. Oh. You know, <laughs> all I had to do was walk in the room and the song would start. He's Mr. Green Christmas. He's Mr. Sun. He's Which I will not sing, by the way, for scarring purposes, both ways. Uh, but yeah, nice one. Yeah. Well, so hi, congratulations, Yay, right. <laughs> Give her a big round of applause, everybody. Good job. 
question is, are all types of solar activity dangerous? And only a fraction of the flares or the coronal mass ejections are directed towards the Earth. And even those, not every single coronal mass ejection that hits the Earth is going to cause problems. Several things have to be correct for the, the series of events to happen for us to have issues here. So no, only a fraction of the, of the solar activity impacts us here on Earth. If I could just add to that, uh, the sun puts out kind of, you might say, two kinds of energy. It puts out particle energy and the solar wind and things uh, that Holly's been talking about. It also puts out electromagnetic energy. And uh, the really good news for us is that our atmosphere intercepts uh, most of the high energy radiation from the sun, the gamma rays, the x-rays, and almost, almost all of the ultraviolet rays. Not all of them, of course, because you guys still get sunburns and suntans. But it just filters them right up, doesn't let them get to the ground. And so our atmosphere actually plays a, uh, a stronger role, I'd say, as the magnetosphere in protecting us. What is the time lag between the time space weather originates on the sun and it reaches here on Earth? The energetic particles that come from flares can get here very fast. They travel almost at the speed of light. So within minutes, more than a little bit more than eight minutes. But for coronal mass ejections, they have a variety of speeds. Some of them are um, slower than others. Some of them are very fast that can travel as fast as 2,000 kilometers per second. So between a day and three days to, uh, before they actually reach the Earth. And that helps, that helps us to um, mitigate those effects if we have to put satellites into safe mode or anything like that. How are uh, stereo and SDO protected? because they're much closer. Um, I mean, you know, if, if we have a little time to put them in safe mode, how do they respond to different solar activity? That's a good question. Well, one of the ways that we protect our spacecraft is that we take the very sensitive electronics in the spacecraft and we do something called radiation hardening of these electronics. Anytime we go into regions with high particle activity like the magnetosphere of Jupiter or come near the sun, uh, we run the risk of electrons and protons from the sun really messing up our uh, sensitive electronics. And the better our electronics get, the more susceptible they are. So there is a technique where we radiation harden them and make them a little bit more pervious to these effects. Well, before we wrap up, we have a treat for you. As you know, it's Sun Earth Day 2011, and we're, we've been fortunate enough, we're gonna be working with the Sun Earth Day team in 2012 for, yep. uh, for a great event that's gonna take place in June. So we have a, a cool promo we wanna show you. Check it out. For centuries, astronomy has been an essential part of life for the people of Hawaii. In 1874, King David Kalakaua invited seven British astronomers to Hawaii to witness a rare and predictable astronomical event, forever altering the way we understand our solar system. Next year, this unique solar event returns, viewable in its entirety from Hawaii's many advanced high-tech observatories. As planet and star align, what will we discover? The sky is the limit. In June 2012, NASA EDGE will be here in Hawaii in the shadows of the sun. Bringing you live coverage of the transit of Venus. We want to thank everyone watching the show today and we look forward to seeing everyone at the transit of Venus in 2012. See you then. Wait a minute, Chris. According to my notes, we still have 23 seconds left. Uh, right. Uh, let's just enter this into our new QR code. That barcode. Is that on the screen now? It sure is. Okay, so anybody that has a smartphone with an application that reads barcodes, you can aim it at the screen now. And what will they get, Chris? Well, boy, just make sure you don't connect the dots. Connect the dots? It's not one of those There's 3D no pictures viewers. There. Okay, no. all right. Yes, just aim it at the screen and you should be good to go. You see the picture in there? Do you have to defocus your eyes? I don't think it's 3D.